Father, you've given us a vision of this morning of standing before your throne is faultless, faultless. Lord, without blemish, holy, acceptable to you. Father, and that's what we long for. We long for the fact that we can stand before you and see your face or be in your presence. Lord, and be considered righteous and be considered holy. Lord, and we know that that's the promise that you give us through your Son. We ask that you would be with us this morning as you tell us what only you can tell us. Lord, and as you give your word to us. Pray all this in his perfect name. Amen. Morning, church. As always, it's truly an honor and a privilege to proclaim God's word to his assembly this morning. Even though our assembly this morning seems to be a little bit um, smaller than normally, um, God promises that he's with us even if two are gathered. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you have one nearby, would you turn with me to the passage we'll be reading together this morning? In Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. If you can, follow along as I read. When he returned to Capernaum, this is Jesus. Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days. It was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there, many gathered around that there was no longer, excuse me, I really messed this up. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them. So that they were all amazed and glorified. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Would you pray with me? Father, bless our time together. Bless this message for us that you've given to us. Allow it to change us. Lord, speak through me. Bless the study that I've done. Father, because it's all for naught if you don't speak through, um, speak through me today. I ask all this in your precious name. Amen. I doubt I need to convince any of us in this room this morning that there's a lot wrong with the world that we live in. As much as our lives can bring us happiness and contentment at times, there always seems to be the threat of pain and of sorrow and of suffering. The potential for these things sits crouched around every corner. And this means that we can't escape the fact that evil is always a real possibility in our lives. Like some stubbornly gray cloud looming over our heads in an otherwise cloudless sky. Evil, one way or another, is part of the reality of living in this world as people. And this morning, I want us to recognize that the Bible has to, what the Bible has to say about evil this morning and how God has come to conquer it. First and foremost, I think the Bible teaches us that all of this suffering, all of the evil we experience or have yet to experience, all of it can be divided up into two categories, just two. First, that which we ourselves commit. And second, 
that which we receive. The Bible describes this in terms of something called sin. It explains that as people, we're all sinners. And this means that we freely sin against other people as well as, as, well as against God. We disobey Him. We don't love Him as we should. We hate. We lie to. We steal from. We slander our neighbors. All these things exist under this biblical category of sin. And one of the ways that sin impacts us, one of the ways that evil exists in this world, is through our identity as sinful, broken people who are constantly engaging in this and committing sin ourselves. And all of us are guilty of this. But in addition to committing sin, it's important to realize that we also receive sin from outside of ourselves. Just as often as we sin against others, we are also sinned against and wronged by our neighbors. And this is the second way that we experience evil. In fact, even when we suffer evil at the hands of nature, um, like most of us did when Hurricane Sandy blew through a few months back, the Bible gives us warrant to believe that even this suffering, which no one created or intended, even this suffering is still an effect of the power of sin which humanity lives under. All pain. All death, all injury, all illness, whether it's thought up in the hearts and minds of other people or whether it arises agentless from the fallen world that we inhabit, all of this has resulted from this thing called sin. So like I said earlier, all that is wrong with this world has resulted either directly or indirectly from this thing. And as such, all of us stand before God this morning as both criminals, but also as victims as both sinners and sufferers. I think the passage I read from Mark 2 has a lot to teach us about how God understands and ultimately conquers and does away with sin and does so completely in His Son. Not only does Jesus deal with sinners, but He also deals with sufferers. And this, it seems to me, is why the Gospel is so amazing. It confronts both expressions of sin. Comprehensively, And simultaneously, both that which we commit and that which we receive at the hands of others. Whatever the case may be, whether we find ourselves feeling guilty and hollow this morning, ashamed of the ways we've ignored God or mistreated others, or whether we feel like we've been taken advantage of, or that we're suffering from something outside of our control, that we're victims, or even if we feel both, which I think all of us should and do feel, at times. Regardless of the side of sin we find ourselves on today, I believe Jesus has something important to say to us through His Word. So to that end, I want to proceed through the text by looking at three topics. First, the forgiveness of the sinner. How Jesus pardons us as those who commit sin. And second, as the healing of the sufferer. How Jesus cares for those and heals those who suffer from sin. And lastly, we'll try and draw together some conclusions about how both of these actions, which I believe beautifully reveal how God deals with sin exhaustively in all of its forms, lastly, we'll say something about how they testify to Jesus' lordship and the kingdom he inaugurates in his ministry. So first, the forgiveness of the sinner. It's reasonable to assume that not much could possibly have happened in the Gospel of Mark by the time you get to the second chapter, um, because it's the very beginning of the book. There hasn't been a lot of time, but in reality, quite a lot has happened so far. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. He's tempted in the wilderness. He begins his ministry in Galilee. He calls some of the twelve disciples. He performs an exorcism. He heals many in Simon's house. We're not told how many. And last but not least, he heals a leper just before the passage we're dealing with at the end of chapter 1. So needless to say, his reputation is growing daily and quickly. In fact, Mark tells us in 145 that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but instead stayed out in the country and people came to him from every corner. He's becoming extremely popular. So when chapter 2 starts, we're given the scene. Jesus has been preaching and healing in the town of Capernaum. And a crowd of people find him within one of the homes there. And begin to press in on him um, to hear what he has to say. 
Verse 3 tells us that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. The house is mobbed. But it's probably not a loud mob because everybody's anxious to hear what Jesus has to say. You can imagine dozens of them leaning in as far as they can, the whole lot, completely silent, except for maybe the shuffling of feet as others try to work their way into the house. Without a doubt, they've all heard how Jesus healed a leper a few days ago. This miracle and how he healed others who were sick before that. And now they've come, straining their ears to listen to the man for themselves. It's in this context that Mark begins to tell us about the paralytic. Many of us probably know about this story because visually, I think it has an uncanny way of sticking in our minds, or at least I remember it even from Sunday school years back. A group of people carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher come up to the entrance of the home hoping to get an audience with Jesus so that he can heal their friend. But no one is budging. And there's simply not enough room for them to carry the stretcher into the crowd. So one of them has a really creative idea. If they can't enter the house through the door, they'll try entering it through the roof. They hoist their friend up onto the roof of the house and they begin pulling the thatching of the ceiling apart, which I'm sure Jesus and the others in the house observed from below, which I find interesting that Mark doesn't mention. And when they get a big enough hole, they lower their friend down into the home with a few ropes. And you can picture this paralyzed man coming down from the ceiling on a stretcher, hovering over the crowd until maybe they moved away to make room for him, until he lay face to face with Jesus. It would have been very strange indeed for Jesus to try and ignore what had just taken place. No doubt he's been made aware that something has happened above his head as the bits of straw and mud begin falling down on his head um, from the ceiling. But Jesus' response to the paralytic man lying before him is still very strange. He tells the man in verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven. The author Mark tells us that he saw their faith. And apparently the faith of the ones who carried them and lowered him down from the roof So the forgiveness of the man's sins is associated or perhaps even brought about, I dare say, by the faith of his friends. They had trusted confidently in the fact that if they could get their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus, if they could just manage that feat, then God would heal him. God would forgive him. I don't think we should miss this because, church, this is the gospel. That God desires to forgive us when we come to him trusting that he will do so. When we have faith in Him. The interaction we just talked about depicts this truth simply and clearly. But if what I said at the beginning of the sermon is true, that we experience both sin sin as both that which we commit ourselves and that which we suffer from causes outside of us, then Jesus has only dealt with half the problem so far. He's ignored the obvious fact that this poor paralyzed man is still paralyzed. The paralytic man may be absolved of his sin, but he's still suffering. Now the story is not over, but I think Jesus' decision here to forgive sins first is critical for us. Because in doing so, he's telling us that forgiveness is our greatest need as people. Society tells us that we have all kinds of needs, right? All we have to do is watch TV for a few minutes. We need to be thinner. That's a big one. Um... We need to have fancy cars. We need to shop at certain places. We need to take certain medicines. We need to use certain shampoos. We need to know certain people, etc. But it doesn't stop here. Society doesn't just tell us that we need material things, but it tells us that we need some noble things as well. Because plenty of humanitarian organizations tell us that we need um, confidence, peace of mind, Friendship, community, um, this ambiguous word, wellness. Lots of people tell us that these are the things that we need. But when Jesus tells the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven, he's not saying that forgiveness is all we need, but he is telling us in the face of a society which tries its best to convince us that we have countless other needs that need addressing, that forgiveness is our biggest need, and that he's come to offer it, and offer it freely. He sees through the the paralysis of this man, which to human eyes looks by far to be his most pressing necessity, and understands that as a sinner, he is in desperate need of forgiveness 
the expiation of his sins, the removal of his guilt, the justification of his life before a holy God. All other needs in the human life are secondary to this. So let's talk about the second phase of the story, the healing of the sufferer. After Jesus publicly forgives the sins of the paralyzed man in the midst of this crowded room, the paralyzed man whose friends lowered him down from the roof, the author of Mark tells us in verse 6 that some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? This blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And just as an aside, I think it's not insignificant to note that the scribes are in fact sitting in this crowded room. Even though the house is filled to its limits and there are crowds of people outside struggling to hear what Jesus has been teaching, the scribes have somehow found room enough to sit. This, it seems to me, is a telling illustration of their humility. And it's in this arrogance that they witness Jesus And they see Jesus' words to the paralytic. They see that Jesus has pronounced forgiveness. And they recognize, and I think rightly so, that this miracle worker has claimed an authority that humans are not supposed to claim. God alone can forgive sins. Who is this man that he thinks he can wield the power of God? You almost hate to say it, but for all appearances, the scribes are right to condemn Jesus. That is, is, this is blasphemy. That is, if Jesus were only a human. Now, sensing that there were those in the crowd who were questioning his words along these lines, Jesus says something a bit confusing. And I think this is sort of the crux of the passage. Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? I think at some level, Jesus knows exactly what he's done by forgiving the sins of the paralyzed man before him. Sure, he's facilitated healings and exorcisms already in the Gospel of Mark, but so far, he's been careful not to exercise the authority he has. The authority that he has as God's Son, as God himself. The authority to forgive. So the implicit answer to this question, what is easier, is actually one about his identity as God. It is easier to heal the man and bid him to stand up and take his mat and walk. People can do this. Doctors can heal people, at least to some degree. What's harder is that which only God can do. What's harder to accomplish is that which he has already done, namely the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has already done this for all to see. He's already proven that he's God. So he goes on saying, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. Finally, Jesus does what we all expected him to do in the first place. He heals the paralytic. He restores him and commands him to walk. In verse 12, the author tells us that the man obeyed. He stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them. He did exactly as Jesus had told him. So let's try to put this together. Jesus doesn't heal the paralytic man at first. Instead, he forgives him of his sins. In fact, it's only when the scribes see him forgive the paralytic sins and begin questioning him that he sees fit to heal him at all. You almost get the feeling that Jesus didn't really intend on healing the paralyzed man, but was compelled by the scribes. So what was his reason? What was his reason for healing this man of paralysis I think that the author of Mark puts the reason in Jesus' words, even though I think we might have missed it. Because in verse 10, Jesus says, But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus heals the paralytic to give the crowd proof that he's God. And this is how all healing works. Healing of any kind is a response to our doubts It's an answer to all who question whether Jesus really does have the power he claims. The power to forgive sins. When God heals us, whenever he does, he's testifying to his greater work, which is a work only God can facilitate. The forgiveness of sins. And this is the most pressing need of humankind, as we already said. 
Not the healing of our bodies or the satisfaction of our minds or the peace we crave in our relationships. Yes, these things are important. But the chief necessity is that which we can't accomplish for ourselves. The forgiveness of our sins. We need forgiveness more than we need any material thing. We need only what God can offer us. So as I wrap up, let's try and think about how the lordship of Jesus is attested in this short and simple story. I want to read a passage at the end of the Gospel of Mark because I think this story in chapter 2 has a lot to do with what ends up happening to Jesus much later in his ministry. If you can, turn with me in your copy of Scripture to Mark 15. Now, beginning, I'll be beginning in uh, verse 53 and reading through verse 65. So follow along if you can. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony didn't agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And all of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. It's interesting to me that here at his trial, Jesus only answered his accusers when they asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? It's only when they ask him if he's God that he responds, And says in the words of the God of Israel, I am. Finally, at the end of his ministry, the scribes have understood the claim that Jesus was making 12 chapters earlier when he pronounced the forgiveness of sins for the paralytic who was lowered down before him from the rooftop. Jesus' first response to this man was to absolve him of guilt. And that absolution was something he knew would be recognized as a claim of authority. He was admitting to the crowd that he was God. He didn't do this in the hope that those who witnessed this miracle might allow him to live out his days peacefully as a teacher. On the contrary, Jesus understood that the cost of forgiving and healing humanity was death. Blasphemy was a charge that that demanded capital punishment under the law. He knew that his stunt in Capernaum would snowball into the events that would ultimately cost him his life. Forgiveness, when it comes to us, always comes at a great cost. So I think the lordship of Jesus is attested in two ways here in Mark 2. First, in the authority that Jesus claims when he forgives the paralytic. And second, in the wholeness and in the scope of Jesus' interaction. In forgiving and healing this man, Jesus is telling those who've gathered around him that this is what the kingdom of God looks like. It doesn't just look like divine sympathy, even though having a Savior who shares and empathizes with our suffering is extremely important. And it doesn't just look like God's hand at work in our lives as He heals and as He strengthens us. Though this is also important to the kingdom. Furthermore, it doesn't just look like the justification of our souls before God. Mark 2 makes it plain that Jesus' ministry is not just about forgiveness. But it's also about healing. The kingdom of God is actualized in the concrete and the tangible dismissal of all that sin affects, both through us as sinners 
and upon us as sufferers. The kingdom of God deals with both. At the end of the story, in verse 12, the people are amazed. And it says that they glorified God. Now in this context, the context where Jesus' identity as God is being questioned, what might it mean for the people to be glorifying God? What exactly does the author mean? Were the people glorifying Jesus? The Son of Man who was standing and teaching in their midst? The one who just exercised divine authority to forgive sins? Or were they glorifying the God of Israel? whom the scribes believed Jesus had blasphemed when he healed this man. Or maybe there's a third option here. Does Mark leave this reference to God ambiguous? This claim that the people watching Jesus glorified God is a big clue, I think, in the story. I think it tells us that many of them understood exactly what had been proven in their midst. Just as the word God is left ambiguous here at the end of the story, I believe the entire New Testament is an attempt to make the term God ambiguous because it argues that this miracle worker, this one who forgives sins and heals people of their paralysis, this is God in the flesh for us, Jesus the Christ. In conclusion, I want to quickly address the nature of sin that we were discussing at the beginning. I had said that all evil was created by sin, was a result of sin, and that we experience the sin in two ways. As either sinners, those who commit it and create it, or sufferers, those who receive it from outside of ourselves. And as I've said all along, I think Jesus deals with sin by addressing both of these identities. He forgives and he heals. We're never told which of these categories the paralytic man belonged to because Mark 2 doesn't try and explain how this man's condition arose. Whether he was born with paralysis or maybe he was injured by a mistake or perhaps even in battle. We don't know anything about his background. We don't know how he became a paralytic or why he has such dedicated and creative friends or what sins Jesus forgives when he forgives his sins. We don't know anything. In some ways, the effect of sin that we deal with on a daily basis, I think, the effects are very similar. We don't know why we suffer or whether we brought it upon ourselves or not. And Mark doesn't seem to think this is important to the story. In the face of sin, Mark merely proclaims that God has dealt with it in all of its forms. And that in doing so, he's paid a great cost. Even death on a cross for our sake. Would you pray with me? Father, it's so easy to make your gospel simpler than it is. It's so easy to think that the only reason you came was to forgive us. Lord, but you came to do so much more. You came to take all of sin and death and conquer it in all of its forms. Lord, you didn't just come to the guilty, but you came to the sufferer. You came to the one who is experiencing the brunt end of sin. Lord, I praise you because you've dealt with sin in its complete comprehensiveness. Lord, and that's why we praise you as God. Because you have, you have suffered death for our sake, but in doing so you've defeated all that death affects us. We praise you this morning and we ask that you'd be with us as we leave this place. In his perfect name, amen.